Can you march? Can you say Happy Memorial Day? I have a lot of military history in my family. And I think that that was more of a driving force than the opportunity to go to war. Okay. Stop. Did you uh, feel disillusioned in the military or with it, or you must have joined freely in the beginning? Yeah. I mean, I joined when I was 19. You don't really know anything about the war, you know? Just, just being uh, naive about the whole mm -hmm. process. As soldiers, you're not allowed to question what's going on, but, you know, I mean, we talk, you know, yeah. all the time. You know, what are we doing? I mean, we're not there to think about that, but, you know, if you can't get behind a mission and know what you're doing 100%, you know, that causes confusion. And I think that's where a lot of the uh, moral injury comes from. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trouble processing this stuff is because if you don't have a clear cut mission, then what are we doing? Yes. Hey, there's a mosque right back there, too. So you got to tell them it's that mosque over there, right? This one over here? Yeah. That's the one Russell was shooting at over there. Seven, this is one over. And that's the guard just shot them all up. They all, they all did. It's the raw, primitive feeling. I did something terribly wrong, and I, I just don't know whether I was justified or whether I can be forgiven. The cure has to involve the honesty to acknowledge, yes, I did this. You know, as his partner, you and you, you study this, so you know about it. But just in in your life, how were you seeing his um, maybe his symptoms, or how, how did you see that he still hadn't processed everything that he needed to? When we're sleeping, and I wake up because he's yelling, "Flare, flare!" Yeah, that was one of the big ones. Some detachment, of course. You know, when he gets quiet and doesn't talk to me, I know something's going on. 
And I know it's not me because it's not Rumini. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's me. Uh, but, oh, well, another thing is um, some drinking, like mm. drinking a lot that bothers me. <laughs> So I was actually in Tom's same team, third squad. So we trained for probably a year together before we deployed. All male targets are bad. All male targets are bad. And, you know, everyone in the platoon immediately warmed up to Tom. It'd be hard not to. So it was all new, it was all exciting to me. I don't think I really had a grasp on the gravity of the situation. You know, being young and in the infantry, they just train you to, this is what you're gonna do, go and do it. And you have that mentality, and then once you get over there, it's a completely different game. You see enough people getting hurt and you know see other people get killed and it kind of start to write yourself off in a way so you kind of are resigned to the fact that you might as well just consider yourself already dead and if you make it home you're lucky because that's the only real mental shift you can make to make it through those kind of scenarios without kind of freaking out you're all right everybody's good we're good everybody's good let's get back to the fucking base is what we need to do yeah. all right guys that's them. I mean, mentally, you're processing the situation you're in and the dangers, but you're not feeling it. So that carries over to civilian life when you get out. This was Christmas. Yeah, I remember that so one was... when Grandpa was still alive. Yeah, yeah. and we, we use that as our Christmas card now. Yeah. Do you remember that morning that we went to the first appointment? Kind of. I had arranged to come pick you up, and you didn't answer the door. Yeah. And you didn't answer your phone. So, so I snuck around the alley, and luckily your window opened. Yeah. So I so I pushed the window open and you were you were asleep and uh, I was like hey it's time to go to your appointment and you were like expletive expletive leave me alone I don't think you'd ever said anything like that to me ever yeah in our whole lives you know but for some reason I just waited yeah I think maybe for like thirty minutes or something just kind of st stood there on your windowsill. And you kept sleeping. Yeah. And then, and then I said, I just tried the same thing again. I just said, okay, well, I think now we can go. We went to a vet center, yeah. And we went and you filled out the thing and I just kind of waited in the waiting room, but I remember, I couldn't hear what you were saying, but I could just hear you talking. And after, I swear, like just two minutes of talking, all of a sudden I just heard you sobbing. Yeah. Which I don't think I had heard you cry or seen you cry or anything. Yeah. You know, since you'd been back. So I was, I was actually relieved in that moment. I was relieved in that moment because I, I felt like that was something that had to happen. Yeah, that was the, uh, probably the first time I've ever talked to anyone about, you know, what had happened. So it and was, that, uh, and that was a long time after yeah. you were done too. Yeah. So sometime back now, it must have been six, eight months ago, he called and had this idea that he was going to, you know, drop what he had going, put on a ruck, and walk to California to clear his head. And then down the road, he's like, hey, I need some gear for this. He's like, hey, I've got this pack here. And I took a bunch of pictures of it and sent it to him. He's like, yeah, that'd be great. And so, you know, I was happy to send it out to him. And, 
you know, he told me he's going to walk it back to me. You know, you can never know the extent of what someone else is thinking and what they're going through. But it's pretty clear when someone says, I'm going to drop what I'm doing and walk to California from Wisconsin. He's dealing with something. Like when I started having issues when I first came home, it was really hard to get out of bed in the morning because I felt like I was just breaking down. But when I feel that way, I don't want people around me. So I make it intolerable to be around me. My wife, my family, they're so supportive of me. And when I was gone, they were trying to keep everything together back here. And then I repay them by being just a tremendous dick. Like, how do I make up for that? I don't really know if I can. Morning, guys. Sorry I'm late. No, don't sweat it. I was going to meet you there at the elevator, and then I got sidetracked. So it'll just be me. Tom's really sick. No, that's cool. That's so. fine. I'd like to ask you a lot of questions. So yeah, personal, yeah. if you don't feel like answering that, that's cool. No. He brought it up, he was the one he who said. He called me and said, I'm gonna walk out to California. There's some guys I served with out there. I'm just gonna go walk and see them. And I said, how about I come with you? Outside of the raising awareness, like I need it. What, what possessed you to join? Was it just, hey, this is a cool thing, this is gonna be... Like join the military? Yeah, was um, it an adventure? Was it the color green? I mean, you know, no. what, what was it? Ever since I was a little kid, like, my family would preach more or less, you know, like, service. You know, you have to be involved in your community. You have to do things like... like but now when you're there... You in know, Iraq? And yeah. I mean, and you're looking at an up-armored vehicle, and you're seeing your buddies have to put sandbags and yeah. things. Yeah, uh, my vehicle, we were hit by IEDs. You'd see the aftermath of violence. We came up on um, an Iraqi police officer that was killed in a drive-by shooting, and he was sprawled out in his like a uh, Toyota 4Runner. And I remember seeing him and being like, that's fucked up. I came here, I was prescribed Ambien because I couldn't sleep. And I took Ambien and it made me as loopy as loopy can be. The care providers I had at the VA, I have a great deal of respect and gratitude for their work. The VA, as an institution, it sucks. Why is that? Because they make everything incredibly hard. Because they make mistakes and it's your fault because you show up and appointments are canceled and it's like, well, now what am I supposed to do? That's why like when I came back this time, I swore I would never come to the VA again for anything. So why did you? Because I was in such an incredibly low place that I knew if I don't change something, I'm gonna kill myself. That was 2008? That was November of last year. As an anthropologist, I study the perspectives of veterans. I interviewed about 20 different veterans over the last three years to equal about 60 interviews. Mostly, I was trying to understand what it felt like to get the diagnosis of PTSD and also to understand better if that diagnosis offered them anything. When Tom and I decided to do this, one of the first thoughts in my mind was that I had to take something to protect myself. We've taken those steps and 
got our permits and checked along the path to make sure that we're legit, but we need to make sure that what we're gonna take on the trip is functional. You know, it's the challenge of a lifetime for two Milwaukee area veterans walking from Milwaukee to Los Angeles, carrying everything on their back. On August 30th, Tom and Anthony will take their first steps from Milwaukee's War Memorial. The trip will take them nearly 2,700 miles through 107 cities and last roughly five months. These are the headlamps we'll wear. Uh, they were donated. Just got this donated. When I last spoke to Tom and Anthony, they were still looking for a few more donated supplies, such as quality shoes and dehydrated food. They say they're doing it to raise awareness about the issues that veterans face when they come back home from war. Like, let's say a helicopter had to come in. There's different ways that you can signal for them, like, and we've got different ways we can do it, but this is one of them. Right here, you twist that to cut off all circulation in that limb, and then you can Velcro it up and then dress, dress the wound around that. Um, but once this is on, you're pretty much uh, losing your limb. Do either one of you um, suffer from any of the um, issues that you hope to raise awareness about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hey girl. Hi. Is she in a good mood? She's kind of hungry, so she's cranky. Can I see you? Good girl. Can <laughs> <laughs> you give me a kiss? You're nervous. What's this? What's that called? Elbow. That's yeah. right, elbow. Very good. Very good. Play with my hair. I was just going through finding pictures from his first deployment, he had put all these um, notes together in different places of the house. Uh, you are my sunshine, my oh only my sunshine. God. You don't have to share that one. <laughs> Fuck that. I got a rep. I got to maintain. You know, his pre-deployment persona. Holly, I love you. I love you. I love you. You are everything good to me. Let me make you as happy as you make me. I love you, miss you, cherish you, honor you, adore you, and hold you in my heart. Please know that I'm with you 24-7 and cannot wait for our joyous reunion. I love you, sweetheart, Anthony. I was saying to Holly that I would feel like absolute shit if at the end of this, Tom felt like he didn't get out of it what he needed to get out of it because he just wanted to go walk and figure some shit out for himself. Then when I kind of injected myself into the mix is when it became Veterans Trek. If you look at my generation, the Vietnam vet, over 58,000 died. Within 10 years, triple that number had committed suicide. A half a million showed up in our prison systems. So we can do a better job of this. I'd like to thank all the people that have reached out and said, when you come into my city and town, please stay at my house. Please use my internet, take a shower, do your laundry, let me feed you. Um, I'm not gonna argue with any of those things. <laughs> Hey, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Tom Voss. Um, I kind of want to take this time to uh, kind of explain why we're doing this. Um, it's not only um, for Anthony and myself to, to help heal from war, but we're really doing it for uh, all the veterans without a voice and uh, all the veterans who are in their holes right now not able to um, to, to be here. So I'd like to dedicate this to um, all those who can't be here and who are taken too soon from us. And if we can just give them a moment of silence.
Thank you. Hey, slow down, bro. You in a hurry or something? <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> Thank you. My ass crack hanging out. <laughs> the last view Milwaukee will get of me is just my crack. It's like angled right or not. It was a full day of rest and my feet basically just could not take it. I was feeling like a tremendous asshole. I put on Facebook that I, you know, I was sorry we had to stop. And uh, almost immediately people started posting really encouraging stuff. Tom and Anthony are often joined by other veterans. 22 vets a day are, are, are killing themselves, so I believe that averages out to, you know, a vet every 65 minutes. There are soldiers and sailors everywhere that have these problems, and these two selfless vets have decided to go along the route and, you know, make it known. The men have left a lot behind. Anthony has a wife and a daughter who will turn two years old while her father walks. What's the matter? Here, let, let's try one more time. Let's see if he's online, okay? Oh, we'll try again later. Immediately after they get back, they seem perfectly fine. You know, like they, they're happy. They seem happy because they're happy to see you. But then shortly after that, that's when you realize that they're having problems coping. Any time he, he feels anxiety, um, frustration, gets a little bit upset. Even if Madeline's a little overwhelming for him, he will go downstairs. Just shuts himself up. We used to be very close, you know, like very, um, so what's wrong? Oh my gosh, you know, like tell me about what, why are you feeling this way? You know, now it's just leave me alone. And at first, I would take that very badly. And personally, like, you don't want to talk to me. Like, that's, like, that hurt, that hurt me. And now it's like, it can't happen so often. He needs to learn to cope with things better. Here, most of these people are from Iowa. 
related to the uh, Dubuque area. But the problem that I see is that every one of these things is a collection of combat loss. And there's a lot more that happens when people come home. Yeah. It's a there's a lot of people that when they come home, like that stuff never ends for them. Right. And so whether they take their own lives or whether their lives just get away from them. They don't get counted as a combat casualty. No. It's no different than police officers. Police suicides far exceed line of duty deaths. Really? It's, it's the same problem. We're facing the same problem. You're asking people to go into the worst possible human situations that they can be dealt with. I remember one of my first uh, uh, traumatic deaths was a guy crushed in a bobcat. And I remember saying something to my boss, just simply, I'm like, yeah, that's really bad to deal with. And he says, if you can't handle this, you need to get out of the job. That's 1970s, 1980s thought process. That's not a healthy way to deal with stuff. We need to have a conversation, you know? Yeah. And, and it'd be okay to talk about it. No, I'm okay to talk about it. It's just that, uh, uh, it just never seems to change. It's just always anger, 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 anger. That's it. There would be, it would be a great day if just one day I could feel something that was sustainable for that day that was not anger. There, there's a door is the way that I would look at it. And maybe this is a door that you've decided that I just don't want to open up yet and deal with some stuff. Once you start working through getting into that door and into that closet and sorting stuff out, I think you'll be able to make friends and with that emotions and start bringing that anger back down until it's a little more manageable. And if you look at the types of assessments and evaluations they have to take, the combat exposure scale, for example, asks, how many times were you involved in firefights? A, one to two times. B, two to 15 times. C, 15 to 50 times. And then D, more than 50 times. You know, so it really quantifies the pain and suffering and loss that veterans have gone through. You know, it turns it into a scale and then a percentage, and then they'll turn it into different symptoms. And then a diagnosis. I think one of the reasons that standard PTSD mental health therapies and drugs don't work is that those drugs and therapies are really directed towards reducing fear. And so much of the suffering that veterans are going through is more about guilt and about shame and thinking about whether what they did while deployed was right or whether it was wrong. And so that's inherently, you know, a moral dilemma. When I started going to the VA, I mean, the first thing they do is, you know, prescribe you antidepressant sleeping pills. At that time, I was still drinking to sleep. So now, I could drink and take sleeping pills. You know, let's get messed up. You know, let's stop thinking about this. All right, and we're over here on one, two, three. And then one day I said, I'm done taking the antidepressants and I just stopped taking them. So I went through like withdrawals and stuff like that. Felt like I had a heartbeat in my brain. You know, I was done with medication. It didn't help me.
shutdown is now having a direct effect on many. Including the families of five U.S. service members who died over the weekend in Afghanistan. They won't be receiving the normal benefits. One of those affected, a Milwaukee family. 19-year-old Marine Lance Corporal Jeremiah Collins Jr. died Saturday. He was supporting combat operations in Afghanistan's Helmand province. His mother, Shannon, now has to proceed with funeral arrangements, unsure of exactly how she'll pay for it. For the sacrifice that our, our kids are making at, at the age that they're making them, I don't understand how this can be a benefit that's withheld. The last word that we got from the Department of Defense indicated that Collins uh, died earlier last week and his cause of death was listed as non-hostile as the investigation into that death continues. I'm trying to find all I can, every little inch of him that I can. Kind of, it's been kind of obsessive the last few days, so I've got YouTube, a YouTube channel where I have many, many of his videos. Who are you claiming today? Uh, I have my mom, uh, my friend, my fiance, another friend, and my little brother. Yep, that's him. Oh, look at my baby! What else do you do? You feel like if you stop doing it, then you're letting go already, and I'm not ready to let go. I'm not ready to let go. Saying goodbye to my son at the funeral home is probably gonna be the hardest thing that I've ever done. I am now torn between all these people who think this poor kid died when he really killed himself. So I'm not trying to take anything from my son, but as a mom, I guess I, I feel like I have to bear some of that burden because people expect that these kids are getting killed and they don't realize that they're facing mental demons. I would find myself off in that deployment world, you know, rethinking the situation. It's kind of like a reel that just keeps going and you just kind of like go off into that world constantly. And that, uh, you know, that really affects being here in the present moment. Yes. Yes. Do. Got a vehicle moving out. Why the vehicle's moving right now? This vehicle came flying around the corner. Yeah, you are clear to engage it. They didn't know that it wasn't a threat. Two males in the front, and then there was a kid in the back, in the back seat. A lifeless, you know, rag doll that they pull out of the car. I will never be able to forget his face. This man was tortured. He had his nose cut off. And it's, all his fingers were cut off. His toes were cut off. And he was still alive. He was involved in helping us. That's what he was killed for. Uh, in the area, do you see those? Roger, right, on the east uh, and west side of uh, oh, four. The rocket hit basically sent shrapnel into his face and neck area, and they were just covered in blood. They were even manually trying to pump his heart. This was the father figure that we looked up to. He was in charge of us, and now he's gone. I sat down and started crying. Why wasn't it me instead of him? 
we fired off a warning shot, and the truck just kept coming really fast. I ran up to the passenger side, smashed in the window with the muzzle of my weapon. He had two sucking chest wounds. I remember our platoon sergeant just slowly walking up and saying, are we done here, when we were trying to save this guy's life. I'm down. How can a just God let humans do this to each other? There has to be a time when we stop fighting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. I love him and I care for him and I was very understanding of his behavior because I, I knew why he was acting like that. But it doesn't make a relationship very happy. <laughs> I had those feelings before Tom left because there were a couple situations where he got really drunk and he stayed at his friend's house and he forgot to feed the dog, so she ate a curtain, and I'd take her to the emergency room, and she almost died of surgery, and I was pissed. I was like, you almost cost our dog her life, you know, because you were drinking and you had more important things to do. And then just turning his phone off when I was in the emergency room with her, so I'm going through this whole thing by myself. Yeah, so I thought to myself, okay, so he's gonna do this for six months and I'll support him. And when he comes home, if things haven't changed, I made a promise to myself that I was gonna remove myself from the situation. It's been five years It'll be six years in the spring since I came back from my second deployment. It bothers me as much today as it did then, if not more. It's not me saying the war is right or wrong. It's not me saying that what we did was right or wrong or criminal, justified, you know, not justified, whatever. It's when you see the framework of what got you to that point. That is what I find to be wrong. When I, when I see the president in like a White House correspondence dinner joking about where are weapons of mass destruction and looking under a rug in the Oval Office and a closet in the Oval Office and being like, nope, not there, and having a nice little chuckle, that really upsets me a lot. What we thought we were fighting for was to bring democracy to Iraq. That changed to winning hearts and minds of the people to, I mean, it just kept 
you know, getting tweaked and tweaked and tweaked. So, you know, at, at one point you're just like, what are we doing? What's the purpose? Why is that guy lying there dead on the side of the road? People have, especially in the US, a tendency to view conflicts in the context of World War II. They think that we're going after this Hitler and we're gonna take him out and make everything better and unify and you know stop suffering, which isn't the case. Early on in the deployments, I noticed a huge discrepancy between what was going on on the ground and what was being reported on the news at home, uh, to the point where I told my mom, stop watching the news. You know, they're not reporting it factually. Just talk to me. And so because of that, I took it upon myself to start shooting photographs and to try and document everything I was seeing from the ground perspective so that I could come home and, you know, share that story down the road. People gloss over all the civilians that are stuck in the middle of this war. Sometimes you get told so-and-so at this house is part of Al-Qaeda. So we would go in on a raid, kick in the door, do the full thing, stepping over kids on the way you know, while we're interrogating a father on one side, on the left wall is his whole family lined up in complete terror, not knowing whether their husband is going to be taken away from them, not knowing whether they'll ever see him again. And they have no control over the situation. There was an instance where we had found some explosives in a bag hidden on the back of someone's house. And it was clear to us from going after our target that they did not plant it there. So we went into the house, they had us take the males out who lived there, and our commander said, because we couldn't find anyone else to link it to, to take them in. And so they had us lay out all the explosives, lay out an AK and all the magazines, and photograph the guys in front of this evidence, knowing full well that it wasn't theirs. And I was telling the commander, look, I don't think it's these guys. And our captain said, no. You know, tag them up, take them in. So we had to arrest these guys and, you know, flex cuff them and blindfold them and everything else and, and take them away from their family. And I don't know to this day if they ended up in prison or, you know, died in prison or got out or what the case was. But that's definitely not, you know, what we signed up for to go terrorize people, basically. Someone once told me that war is the opposite of love. And the hardest thing about being a veteran is that when you're so young and you go to war and you kill, you don't know what love is yet. And then when you come home, you know, and two, three, four years later, you fall in love and you know what, you know what the love is of having a child or having a husband, or having a wife, or a girlfriend, or you know the love of a parent who really cares for you. And then all of a sudden you reflect on all those people that perished, the sons, the fathers, the wives, the husbands, 
And that's when you really start feeling that moral pain, right? That's really when you start feeling, wow, I didn't know what love was then, but now I do. And I terminated all that love in all those people's lives, you know? Like, what an awful thing to live with. So here's the poem. They are so beautiful and so very young. They seem almost to glitter with perfection. These creatures that I briefly move among. I never get to stay with them for long, but even so, I view them with affection. They are so beautiful and so very young. Rest in peace, Patty, and condolences to the parents. Your body and your mind can only take so much. I mean, you know, I've, I've thought about it a lot, a lot, you know, in my head. It's a really uh, enticing option to not have to think about horrible things on a daily basis. I got to the point of how can I kill myself without ruining myself for the funeral for my family. Hey Tom, this is Linda in Manchester. We've got balloons tied to the mailbox. Oh, you could see it right now. Okay. Well, we better get out there. They're coming this way? Yeah. They're yeah, coming they're down the road. How about some marching music? Yeah. yeah.
Hey guys. I'm Anthony. Great to see you. Tom. You too. Tom. We thank everyone for coming today and we are so happy to have Anthony and Tom here. We are honoring them in their trek um, across America. This dear Lord, thank you for all the good things that you have provided to allow us to do something pleasing in your sight. Hold us up today, Lord, as we hold up those who would and did risk it all on our behalf. Let our love and concern for our heroes be clear today. Reach down today and touch the people of our small town. And most of all, let each and every one of us have our hearts grow and be increased in our ability to care for one another. Amen. Let's eat. When you go and you fight, there are things that are useful to you and there are things that aren't. And a lot of those are emotions. So like you need things that make you a, a good soldier and things like empathy and compassion and kindness. Yeah, they beat that out of you probably. <laughs> there's, no, there's no room for it. I mean, there is between your peers, but when you're out, you have to be aggressive. And so those things that make you a good soldier when you're fighting in a war, they don't work well back here. And it's not as simple as like, turn it on, turn it off. So that's why I think like vets have issues maintaining relationships, you know, and stuff like that. It's just, it's a completely different world. She was driving last Friday on her way to Cincinnati on a snow white Christmas Eve. Going home to see your mama and her daddy with the baby in the back seat. Oh, that was no problem, you too. Try that PDLA. I am. Passion, it's always good to see you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Take care. Yeah, you as well. And have fun when you guys get to Santa Barbara. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not carrying anything because I walked over here without my cane. Give me that other one. I need help for Bama. Well, go on. Hold my hand if you want. Well, hi. Hold your hand. How's the crew? Got this thing stuck on her eye. Have a broken hip. I don't want you to I have a broken hip. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm just too busy. Every day, I receive an email from him subject line, thoughts from the road, or more thoughts, and just what he'd been thinking about that day while he was walking, about what he would change, about what he likes about us, what he likes about Madeline, that he's gonna be a different person when he comes back, more happy, more um, like wanting to spend time with his family more, getting past some of the issues he's had from his PTSD, so. Love those emails. <laughs> Give daddy a kiss. Let's show him the moon, okay? Uh -oh. All right. Now, where's the moon? <laughs> there it is. When you're in Iraq, you don't really have the ability to trust a lot of people. You have uh, people that you're serving with, yeah, you trust them. I mean, you, you have to. But the strangers that you meet, you can't trust them. And so meeting a lot of these new people has helped me maybe like restore some level of faith in people, right? Uh, do I think that I'm all the way there yet? Fuck no. No. I wanted to know what his state of mind was. 
was like, what's going on? As you know, are you processing any of these memories? Are, is this helping you? Because he hadn't given me any indication that anything was getting better. I have had many friends who've served in the military. My father was in the Air Force. One of my good friends, he was a sniper uh, for the Army. And he was telling me his first confirmed kill was uh, he was in the back of a vehicle and they were on a freeway and they were shooting back and forth between insurgents that were behind them and when he fired, was firing at them, his bullet went through the car and hit the car behind them and ended up killing a nine-year-old boy. And so that was something that always weighed very heavy on him. And uh, as you know, there are countless stories of these type of things happening. And I know you have your stories. And so I'd like to just take a moment, if you could think of one thing that still haunts you to this day and sticks with you and you know the one thing that you carry carry deep with you um so we were always told you know like you're there winning hearts and minds it kind of became a joke among us you know like what are you gonna do today and on one particular day uh we were delayed in going out because our gate was being hit by like rockets or mortars or something. And when we left, there were some injured people on the ground. Um, and so we were going very slowly, kind of leaving the gate. And I asked if we were gonna stop to help them and they said no. And so like, I remember like catching eyes with one person in particular, I can still see them, but it was that day that changed my whole perspective on everything. What I was doing, what I was a part of, what we as a collective were doing. Um, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he died laying on the street or if he lived. Um, that's always bothered me quite a bit that I had the ability to help and I didn't because I was told not to, even though I knew better. I can see, you know, perfectly. Like those moments where, you know, you're carrying your uh, senior, uh, <clears throat> seeing someone who's there one moment and then next year, you know, your senior buddy's carrying him out of a vehicle. It's tough. When we take things that happen to us and we try and push them down we try to push the pain down and push the pain away and close the door on it. We never learn the lesson from them. One thing about our traditions is there is no, 
nobody external who can heal you. There is nobody external who can change who you are or the things you've experienced. It has to come from you. You have to make that choice. You have to grab that power and say, I choose this direction or that direction. I choose to learn from this. I choose to gain my power from this. You are now in a place where you can again make those choices, but it's work. It's getting out of our comfort zone. It's a whole new way of thinking. It's being vulnerable. No walls. This is who I am as a human being. People will connect to that because we all want that. And it's being aware of everything around us, being present to that. The great mystery of everything that surrounds us and know that you are part of that. We're sitting in this canyon, and then at the end, he brings us out, and we walk through this little archway, and all it is is wide open space. And you're like, all right, you know, that's that's pretty cool. I was in this area where I thought this is all that life had to give me, and all I did was take three steps, and here is everything else. That view is always there. You just have to be willing to go there to look for it. And then when you realize that, it kind of gives you a whole new perspective. standing on the edge of a cliff just trying to breathe close my eyes and I can feel the Sun it's a nice day I can feel the wind I can hear the different sounds going on and you open your eyes and it's like very blue sky beautiful mountains beautiful prairie leading up to the mountains and you just take a few breaths and it's like looking at a whole new world Which one do I think Madeline made? Or multiples? And try the little angel. <laughs> Let me start with that. Mm. Tastes like Christmas. <laughs> when my daughter was born, I didn't even feel anything. You know? I felt happy for a second, and that was very foreign. And I was like, no, that's how I want to feel. 
So that's kind of what I'm trying to get personally out of the walk, and I think I've achieved that. That's why I'm kind of antsy to go home. Because now I want to see if I really did what I thought I did. I think there's anxiety from both Anthony's wife and my girlfriend about what things are like, gonna be like when we get home. And they don't know really what to expect, I guess. And we have gone 12.2. Right now we're averaging four miles an hour for a walk speed. That's the fastest we've done ever. It'll be nice on Saturday when I get to reunite with them and walk the last seven miles. I was kind of joking with them that they walk 2,700 miles and they get to come in the last seven. It's a really big deal that they're they're doing, but it's also, you know, just my friend I get to see again. Just meeting you. Oh. Hello, man. Good to see How you. How you doing, bud? Good. We made it. Yeah. So, yeah, just head on that way yeah. to the sea. Seven miles and we're done. Nice. Does that seem kind of surreal? Every time we move west, we're like, we're moving towards the ocean, we're moving towards the setting sun. We're like trying to end the things that haven't been working for us. We're trying to get to a point where we can turn around. Oh, I see him. <gasps> there he is. There's Daddy. Is he Daddy? Do you see him? Here he comes. There's Tom. You see Tom? One hundred and fifty-five days and twenty-seven hundred miles later, two Iraq War veterans reached the end of their walk from Milwaukee to California. One brother to another. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for walking with us. Okay. Picture you and your daughter. Sure. It's been a long time. I just passed the uh, five-month mark a little while ago, and I'm really uh, happy to be. Yeah. To make myself a better husband and a better dad. There's no doubt in my mind that I knew 
after the walk that I still had a, you know, a long road of healing ahead of me. By no means did I think that I was better. It's a joke. Tell me what you think. I think it looks good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Again? Yeah. I didn't realize how far away he was emotionally until he came home. I felt like he was just still holding everything in. You know, there's only so much I can do. I mean, I can be an empathetic and compassionate partner but sometimes you start questioning, is this worth it? It'd be easy for me to just, you know, throw my arms up, throw up my walls again and just shut down. This was kind of a last ditch effort to maintain the relationship. We asked you the questions in the beginning, why have you come? And we talked about some of the reasons why people came here, moving beyond challenges, learning to relax, pain management, networking with other vets, and to learn techniques for stress management. So let's bring the right hand up into position. If it works for you, the index finger and the second finger can be between the eyebrows. And let's take a deep breath in. Frontal lobes of the brain have to do with feeling, communication, empathy, being able to connect with other people. So it may visually look a little strange and it may be an unusual experience for you, but it's a really good way to begin to get the brain functioning in a, in a more normalized way. And then using the victory breath, breathe in, two, three, four. I 
I don't know, the uh, alternate, you know, breathing uh, seems to help, but uh, it is kind of difficult to relax. And I just had some really, really disturbing images come up. And at one point, I was ready to walk out of the room. I was, I was losing it. It's challenging because, like, I, like, I'm not calm, you know. But, like, I can see how, I think I can see how I could get there, but it doesn't happen. And then I. It's only, it's only the second day of the course. It's just the result of that conditioning, you know. That 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 hyper arousal is what kept you alive. And yet the body's still stuck in that mode a little bit when it doesn't need to be. So we're beginning to train it to be in another way where you can be alert, but you can also be rested at the same time. And it, it'll take a little while. There's nothing wrong with you guys except that you went through an experience that had a, an effect on the physiology, and you know, not just on the body, but on parts of the mental functioning. And let's come into position for second stage again. And deep breath in. And let it go. So you, what you were doing, you were really on a lengthy retreat mm. or a pilgrimage, to put it in, in a religious context. Yeah. But the, the effects seem to be the same. Yeah. You didn't do this for a religious motive explicitly, did mm. you? No. Uh, it's been a journey. But, I mean, I feel the, the walk was uh, vital to me uh, being where I am right now. I mean, I had to uh, really take the time to address the concerns, whether it's uh, the what ifs, um, the guilt, um, you know, the, the trauma. I mean, so you really have to be with yourself, you know, and I don't think a lot of people do that. As a cultural anthropologist, I collect people's stories. My doctoral research addressed combat PTSD and veterans' experiences with this mental illness label. I chose this topic because I felt our government treated military veterans as expendable, training and using them as disposable assassins and then abandoning them as soon as they were no longer useful. Breathe out. Hold, two, breathe in. These spiel notes that you recite from come from my interviews and the many conversations that I had with veterans. Field note number one. The government doesn't care. I want to make this clear. They don't care about their veterans. They do the least amount necessary to help. It's all about money. The government often glamorizes what we do as soldiers. They paint you as a hero. War is not glamorous. You're confused, lost, but you have duties. The person who prevailed had to kill someone else to get there. That person is still dead. That is not glamorous. It triggered something in me that it was more specific than um, the life before deployment and the life after deployment. For me, that was prior to taking a life and then after taking a life. And I haven't really, uh, I don't think, dealt with that very well. And as far as looking myself in the mirror and accepting uh, the things that I have done and moving past that. So you're still looking in the mirror and you're still wanting to... I haven't looked in the mirror. Is this course allowing you to maybe begin that process a little bit? I think we're working towards 
In the military, violence of action is a term used to describe the gaining and maintaining of physical and psychological momentum in combat. The training to master violence of action capitalizes on muscle memory. In the infantry, soldiers repeat their movements over and over again until it is ingrained, automatic. It is so unhuman, so out of our scope that you have to be trained to do it. You know, they really uh, drive home, you know, what you're there to do, uh, which is kill. You know, I mean, we have cadences when we march about, you know, we're gonna kill. And when you're face to face with that situation, uh, you really uh, don't have time to process it. Yes, you it know? must be hard. These stories have generated a growing empathy within me. Certainly, I will never know what it feels like to be at war in Iraq or Afghanistan. But I know what it feels like to lose someone. I am humbled by these veterans, not because they served and protected our country or spread democratic ideals, but because they are not giving up. They inspire me. At first, um, I guess I really didn't take it too seriously when they said that, you know, a lot of stuff can come up. Um, you can have a lot of emotions and uh, the stuff, you know, the power breath really um, starts sorting these stresses out and starts getting rid of them. And uh, I mean, I had one session that was uh, completely emotional for me. I mean, it, it really uh, brought up a lot of things from my deployment. Um, that I had kind of uh, pushed aside and pushed down. We're discovering that antidepressants don't always reach the depths of this pain. It's the raw, primitive feeling. I did something terribly wrong, and I, I just don't know whether I was justified or whether I can be forgiven. So forgiveness then emerges as a, as a huge issue. Can this man forgive himself? And the implication is, can he forgive God for allowing this to happen to him? How many people did the home program in the power breath? Very good. Good. Feel a little bit better? Yeah. Good. Tom? Uh, feeling pretty clear-headed, you know, to the uh, three-stage breath this morning with uh, Bella's breath, so I'm doing all right, right right now. I feel like, you know, at the very beginning, I was a lot more aggressive, a lot more tense when I was finishing most of these exercises. I started to sweat a little bit, and my heart rate started to increase, uh, but I almost honestly felt like I wanted to cry a little bit. It was kind of weird. Not unusual on this course. It happens all the time. I've talked about my feelings more in the last week than I have probably in my entire life. You know, <laughs> that's weird. I mean, I don't do that. And then now I think I'm a lot calmer than I was coming into this course. Uh, I think I'm a lot more accepting of, of dealing with my own emotions. And not just... You start the course with them where they are now. And you really do travel with them. And then when you see that light come back in their eyes or you see them resting within themselves for the first time, or you see them having a little bit of hope that maybe there could be some small piece of happiness available to them in their life. It's, <clears throat> it's the most rewarding thing that any teacher could ever, ever want. One of the things that Father Thomas Keating said was that veterans weren't able to forgive themselves. And this 
really, you know, it hit me in the chest like a ton of bricks. That, that was it for me. It never crossed my mind to forgive myself. This blessing be upon you now and always. Thank you. You're welcome. So when we did one of the last sessions together, I went in with the intention that I was gonna forgive myself and forgive God. The human psyche has an extraordinary capacity to revive. So if it only has a crack or a few moments of peace, it knows there's something beyond the immediate horrors that it saw. And that is what frees them. So just to sit there without any support at all government or family or nobody understands me and I can't stand myself anymore. That's the moment of the most profound redemption. Right on that one? Okay. I still get angry. I still let people know when I'm angry. But I haven't felt that like super anger, you know, type feeling. Um, like really at all. I feel like things are very hopeful right now. Hope is kind of the motto in our relationship right now. We look forward, we hope for the best. He doesn't care about you. We're meshing again, you know, we're, um, we're becoming like what we were at our best. The thing with me is that I never used to think about the future. That is a huge thing. So when people say it's like a pilgrimage, like, you set this goal and you went and did it and you have these discoveries and whatever. You discover the future, right? There is one if you want it. And you can make it however you want to make it. Get up, Lord. The experience that I had, I can't really put into words, but I felt something that I've never felt before in my life. It felt like 
a ball of emotion starting from my stomach, moving all the way up my chest into my throat and coming out as tears. Whatever I was holding on to by just forgiving myself, by just not blaming anyone else for what had happened while I was deployed and saying, you know, it happened. I literally just said, I forgive you, God. This was not your fault. And that triggered something inside of me that, you know, just came out. And after that I had, you know, I felt completely like a different person. I just can't believe the difference in him. He went from being a very private, very quiet, very introverted person to now he's totally open with his feelings. And um, I don't know, he just talks like, it seems like nonstop. He used to be kind of quiet in here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It's great. It's like something, oh, I, it's like super cliche, but like something awakened, like something, something has peeled away to like allow him to now express himself. This means it's recording, right? When yep. it's flashing. Oh my God, he's moving. So can you explain a little bit? No, not yet. Every year what we try to do is uh, check the milkweed um, around the area and see if we can find some monarch eggs and um, just try to raise a few on our own because right now there's, you know, they're being killed off by you know, a lot of pesticides and a bunch of other factors. Um, we found an egg and now we're, you know, raising the uh, caterpillar until it gets into its, you know, cocoon stage and then we just let him go. We named him Noam Chomsky. <laughs> so, um, last year's caterpillar was Chompy. And then we're like, Chompy too? Nah, yeah, no. But Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I feel like I know what being happy feels like for the first time. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, where is it? You're like, here. I'm just like, okay. <laughs>